Okay, good evening and congratulations for surviving to this hour. I thought maybe as a favor I would get a, uh, just a, a water hose and just kind of spray down the crowd a little bit. Um, my name is Neil Sperling. I'm uh, an honorary member of this, of this faculty and I'm very, very happy to be part of the faculty. I've been coming intermittently but mostly every year for the past uh, 17 years and I very much appreciate the opportunity to be part of it. It's a uh, it's always a great course and very educational and open to lots of discussion and arguments and sometimes food fights. Um, so, we're going to start off pretty simple. We're just going to go through some basic uh, things that I think hopefully will be helpful to everyone uh, in terms of uh, stapes surgery and then we'll get into some challenging cases and, and see what the panel will do. So, uh, let's just start with a very simple presentation of a 53-year-old uh, woman with progressive hearing loss. She works as a musician. Uh, she has no prior history of ear disease. And this is her audiogram. Uh, she has a conductive hearing loss in the right ear greater than the left. Her word recognition scores are, are normal. And the uh, AC stands for air conduction, so the air conduction is greater than the bone conduction with the tuning forks. So I just wanted to start with this very simple presentation to ask the panel to just simply give me what your criteria are for deciding when it's appropriate to operate. Is there, a, is there an audiometric criteria? Is there a tuning fork criteria? Uh, is there a profession, the fact that she's a musician? And, and she's very unhappy, actually. She, you know, she has difficulty hearing things on stage and knowing you know, where, the, where the sounds are coming from and, and being precise about that. So, should we start at the, at the front here? Um, basically, basically, for me, uh, 25 dB airborne gap is too small to make the decision immediately like this. So I would consider following up this patient. And uh, if it's like this and still complaining after a few uh, consultations, I would go for surgery. And I would not make any difference in terms of uh, profession. It's, of course, a little bit more tricky, but I mean in terms of making a decision, but I won't make any difference. John? I, I think at this level I would insist that she, she, she tries in the ear hearing aids. Uh, and if she's unhappy, so hearing aids first? Hearing aids first, follow up with okay. perhaps a couple of serial audiograms. Mm -hmm. And if she's still unhappy, following a very full consultation. Uh, well, long discussions. I mean, she, Chris will tell you about perfect pitch and things. No doubt she's, you know, her hearing is extremely important. I'd be very careful, but I would go ahead with surgery. Well, I've, I've got a particular interest in musicians. I sit on the board of the London Philharmonic Orchestra, so I see lots of patients uh, with musical backgrounds. Um, my threshold generally would be 20 dB, airbone gap. I know that Roberts was over 25, but his revision case was significantly less than that. So there we go. Um, so 20 I, dB on average? On average it would suit me. 20, uh, yeah. And I'm a big fan, as I said earlier on, of tuning forks. Um, if, it's, if it was equivocal, and I think that airbag gaps on the borderline, she's got quite a lot of high frequency loss, mm -hmm. which is not going to come up with surgery, I'd certainly advise her to take, use hearing aids, and I'd have a long and meaningful chat about what a dead ear might mean to her as a musician. Right. Uh, <coughs> I certainly don't want to touch this patient. I'm um, oh, sorry? I, I wouldn't touch. You wouldn't touch. Uh, I wouldn't touch this patient. And uh, I would probably do a CT scan to see if there's any canal dehiscence or something like that because of this uh, mild situation. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking about other diagnosis? Uh, other I would, others. just um, as a possibility. I will also, sorry, I will also wait for a larger album gap. I will perform a CT scan. We will talk about this okay. later. And uh, uh, at the time of surgery, I will uh, say to the patient that the first week after removing uh, the mm, packing, the packing in the yes. in the canal, the patient will lose his uh, uh, uses in uh, musical. Uh, yeah. So immediately after removal of the pack, when they've just had their stapleotomy, they often complain of distortion of pitch, a little bit tinny. So they need to be prepared for that, for sure. Yes, good. Yes, I Robert. would perform a tuning fork tests, uh, 1024, that's C3, and 512, which is C2. Um, if both are negative, I would consider surgery. 
Um, second, um, if I, because it doesn't look like a typical autosclerosis from the audiogram, I would ask her to do Valsalva maneuver, and if she reports that then hearing is improved, mm -hmm. there might be long incus process necrosis, and then it could be an option, the surgery. And then, of course, it's important what the patient wants. It, what kind of musician is she? Is she playing the flute? Is she a singer? Is she She's a brass? jazz musician. Jazz but musician, okay. Yeah. So it's actually protecting her. Yeah, that's uh, right. I told her that. And yes. yeah. so if, if yeah. she still insists, I maybe yeah. would go for surgery, yeah. but yeah. a hearing aid trial is certainly uh, a safe procedure. Well, first, to answer your specific questions, usually I like to depend mostly on the 512 hertz tuning fork. So if they flip that, then I feel comfortable talking about surgery. For this patient, I, I agree a little bit. I'm not very uh, comfortable with the pattern of conductive hearing loss. It's a little, the airborne gap is larger and the higher frequencies. That's right. So you've got to think of uh, you know, a fibrous uh, incluse uh, lesion or something like that. Uh, so I would definitely ask for a CT scan before, go before you know, if, if she's even considering surgery. So if she flips the fork, I talk about surgery. If she wants surgery, I'll do a CT scan before and then just to see. This is typically a kind of audiometric test that you have in case of erosion of the stapes superstructure right. or eroded right. incus. Yeah. So a dislocation of the superstructure from the... Could be, could be. Um, okay. So I, let's see. I think we're going to just go ahead and uh, move on to the next question. So let's just... I know that this was touched upon already, but just very briefly, each of you tell me if you do the surgery... Uh, routine primary stapedectomy, is it done under general or local anesthesia for you? General. General with hypertension. Yeah, general. Uh, general. General with a laryngeal mask. With? Laryngeal mask. Laryngeal mask. Very nice, yeah, yeah. Local. Local. local, yeah, it's always, always local uh, recommendation. If I make, uh, if 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 you allow me to do remarks uh, to this, um, especially considering complications, um, if you have or complications are mainly out of three, three reasons. First, the surgeon during the surgery. Second, the procedures during surgery, and third, after surgery infection. And two out of this we can control under local anesthesia. So if I do something wrong, let's say suction too much and there's fluid going from the vestibule, patient will immediately feel dizzy. So you know you've done something wrong, you can stop, you can change the procedure. Second, if the prosthesis is too long and touches the trickle, patient will immediately report. And third, after the uh, surgery or after the end of the surgery, I can talk to the patient, ask if hearing is improved, I can do this uh, flüstern, I don't know if it's in German, eh, in English. Whisper, whisper, yeah, whisper test, whispering test. Whisper, yeah. But do I you, have the, do you work with the same team, the same anesthesia team for every surgery? Because that's yes. the difficulty with any of us who don't, uh, is that uh, if they don't get it exactly right, th that could be quite a harrowing experience for the patient and for the, phys for the surgeon. I mean, to have a patient start to move or to be too deep or too light is a very delicate balance. We do, so we do not do any sedation at all. No sedation. So patient okay. is just getting local uh, infiltration. But I must of course admit the Germans are tough. They're not tough enough to beat Italy, but uh, Germans, I know that in different cultures, in different countries, it's yeah. probably very difficult to convince a patient for local. But the Germans do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I would love to do mine under local anesthesia for all the reasons that were just mentioned, but right. as you said, I don't have the same anesthesiologist, so I go for general with laryngeal mask. I think it makes a huge difference yes. in, in recovery. Okay, good. And we, we just to complete that question, uh, for revision stapes surgery, is, that, is there a difference in your choice of anesthesia? Does anyone choose a different form for revision than they do for... I, I go local. I bite the so bullet. So you'll go, go local, local for the... But then revision. I ask for my most experienced and make sure they're in the room, okay. so... Any other comments? Okay. Yeah. I haven't used anything except a laryngeal mask for anything apart from laryngeal surgery since 1991. And wh why we do you think, what are the benefits of a laryngeal mask, do you they think? They don't cough and splutter at the end of the operation. They wake up gently, uh, they're not distressed, they don't have a, they don't have a cough. Uh, it just seems a much smoother Gentler. thing. But you have to be working with the same anaesthetist. Yep. He has to know that if you displace the mask, you know you've displaced it. 
both of you had to be capable of reciting it. So if I was with lots and lots of decent anesthetists, I wouldn't be happy using them. Well, one of the hospitals I work at, which is an eye and ear hospital, does, uh, they do deep extubation. So you have, the, you have a, a standard endotracheal tube, and they extubate while the patient is very deep. They're breathing, but they're deep, and there's absolutely no bucking. It's a very gentle, I don't know if this is what, what they do here, but uh, it's very gentle. And so I do agree that laryngeal mask is very gentle, but with the right anesthesia technique, with a full intubation, it can also be very gentle. I unfortunately experienced a dead ear after difficult extubation in an eye and a hear institution. Yes, okay. Let's blame the anesthesiologist for sure on that one. <laughs> okay, shall we move on? Okay, um, tell me what your approach is. What's your preferred approach? I think we know you do transcanal always. John, always John. Yeah. Open. open. Okay. Always do them transcanal. And I have, as I said earlier this morning, when I, over the years, watched online and being a moderator, I just think you get a better view when you do it transcanal. Right. I hope we're going to talk a little bit about endoscopic approaches. Yeah, of course I do transcanal. And I do, I do endoscopic, but it, it's not a... Um, I cannot say that you could improve results with the endoscope. I think if you are, you are a very comfortable surgeon with the endoscope, and the microscope, and you have a choice, you probably end up um, using the endoscope. And I had actually after, I mean, of course I started using microscope, then I, a few years used endoscope, and then I tried to go back to the microscope and I just felt inconvenienced. I felt that I don't have the same access to the ears that I had with the endoscope. But it certainly is, you know, um, I would joke around, you know, the only thing that, the only two procedures that work in, in ear surgery are stabies and cochlear implantation, and I said you don't fool around with these two procedures, so if you're very, you know, comfortable with the microscope, great results, please don't, this is not the reason to think about using the endoscope. Endoral with microscope. Endoral. Yep. Okay. And, and oral with microscope, and the reason of course, we cannot in local. We, it's not no point in using a, a transcanal because the, the, if the patient moves a little bit, you're all your um, safer funnel. Yeah, transcanal. Transcanal. Okay. Great. Okay, and and, and we actually. I think there yeah. are plenty of people who use local anesthetic and a uh, speculum. What's that? Local anesthetic and a speculum. They work fine together. Yeah. I don't. I don't. But without a holder? No, but with a holder. If you use a Yazagil, oh, it's got an articulated arm. You're a real it. surgeon. <laughs> well, no, uh, I'm just saying about people who do a local anesthetic. Well, I uh, use it without a holder too, but yeah. well, just talking you, about local anesthetic. You can anesthetic. use it with a Yazagil because the Yazagil moves. You know, it's got an articulated arm that's just tight. It's not solid. Yeah. There's an interesting, uh, you know, I think a, a macho thing. I think it's in the U.S. Maybe it's elsewhere that uh, to learn how to operate with the speculum without a holder is like a real virtue. And of course, that's the way I was taught. And I, you know, for the first 10 years of my practice, I was ashamed to think about putting a, a speculum holder. And yet the speculum holder just eliminates an entire variable that you can eliminate to make the rest of the surgery more precise. So I don't know if, if you have, does anyone not use a speculum holder? Wow. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, I think it's really good because I think elsewhere in the course we haven't really talked about, um, we've brushed on it, but we haven't really talked about the choice of prosthesis and why you might choose it. And there's enormous number of prostheses available, and there's a lot of reasons why people will choose one versus another. Um, there are various ways to categorize a prosthesis. I think of them as, hold on a minute, sorry. No, not that way, the other way. So I think of them really as two, pr two categories, crimped and non-crimped, but in the crimped category, you can clip it on and not have to actually do the cr crimping, and, or you can use a laser or heat activation to crimp it. But ultimately, the, the top three on this, on this chart are crimped prostheses, and then the bucket handle is basically a, a non-crimped prosthesis. Um, so I just want to say a couple of words, my experience, and then I'd like to hear what, what the panel has to say. I, 
for the most part, have been using bucket handles mostly. They, that has been my go-to prosthesis. I use a titanium bucket handle, and I've, I've always gotten good results, as we all, we all do, so we don't like to think that it's the prosthesis that, that um, has anything to do with it. But there are some factors, and recently um, I did use some heat-activating, heat-activated or, or memory uh, prostheses, and I guess there are three main ones from the three companies. The Olympus Gyrus makes the Smart Piston, and the um, Grace Medical makes the Eclipse Piston, which I've been using a lot. Uh, and then this one, uh, which is from Kurz, which is a really beautiful design that I've, I've gotten a little more familiar with recently and, and, and hope to, to try in the near future. Um, one thing that concerned me when, when I started using these, and I, I don't know if it'll show well, but I want you to just watch how this crimps. Um, this is going to loop, so you're going to see it again. And it does look like magic at first, how this crimps, but if you look at the length of the prosthesis on the second strike, it lifts up. Now, I've been told that that's not the way it's supposed to work, and I think that the design is that the, um, just the, the crook is now heat-activated, and it shouldn't shorten the length. But this, this certainly concerns me about the design of this type of prosthesis. Um, so let's see what, what the members of the panel use and, and why. Well, we know what you use. Well, it, it, I don't use heat activator because we don't need heating here. We let the sample <laughs> frames don't need that. We have plenty of so heat. <laughs> no, I use the Teflon piston all, all the time. Uh, and the main reason is that, as I said, the use of a Teflon is that you can trim the piston according to each case. Mm -hmm. uh, I measure and I trim it. If you use a titanium process, it's different. You have to open up the specific length, which is not available all the time. But I, I'm... Well, it looks nice when you see that, but I don't like too much the, the fact that the loop, the wire loop, is so mm -hmm. thin. I would consider that as a risk of uh, um, struggling the, the incus, but that's my... You thing. know, it's interesting, because I, I know you for a long time, and, and you're a person who likes to innovate and change things, and you've changed so many things about your surgical techniques in general, but that Teflon hasn't changed in all yeah, these years. Yeah, but I wanted to change. As we I, I'm not saying you should. I, we're I'm just, just discussing this you. with Uwe, because I wanted yeah. to... I, I, I asked the company, two companies, Quartz mm -hmm. on one side and Grace Medical. I said to them, this is very nice, I like the concept, mm -hmm. but I would like to make it in Teflon also. So could you make the same thing with the heat mm -hmm. force, with the wire part, but could you cover it, at least in fairly or in some part, with Teflon, so that the Teflon will be uh, not so struggling, the incus. And I was thinking of maybe having a, a small part of a loop which was not uh, uh, covered by Teflon, and then in this part you can just touch it as, as you show, and then it can crimp. And they tried to work on that, and it couldn't make it. Otherwise, I would move to but this. Why Teflon? Why is it that important to have because Teflon? The, the, because the, the, I mean the, when the Teflon touches the incus, of course there are erosion, of course, but I, I don't like that I don't like the, the, f the fact that the wire one is very oh, it thin. It strangulates. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Teflon is, is wider. Okay. So the shaft doesn't need to be Teflon. You're concerned only at the level of the incus, is what yeah. you're saying. For me, it needs to be Teflon because I need to be able to cut it. Oh, okay. Yep. Well, I've been using Teflon since 1991. Um, and I would say until five years ago, six years ago it was perhaps 90 percent large loop teflon um, and very occasionally bucket handle but now i would say probably 30 percent bucket handle the reason for that is that it, it's technically quite difficult when you start to insert a bucket handle prosthesis in the uk we have the expression patting your head and rubbing your tummy at the mm -hmm. same time you're doing two unnatural movements you're lifting the incus and you're trying to manipulate mm -hmm. the bucket handle underneath the lenticular process. And it took me a few months to get good at that. But I, I really do like the bucket handle now. And I think if you can When crimp, I can't make my mind up of in. the two, yeah. I will default to the bucket handle. Yeah. Yeah. But you cannot use a bucket handle all the time no, no, no. Because, because you need enough gap between yeah. the promontory Absolutely. and the lenticular process. But I, uh, but I will say, my experience is uh, almost the reverse of yours, that you can use it most of the time but not all of the time. There are times where I have to use a piston, but I know that you're, I mean, we, we have different thresholds of when. I don't mind the, the little bit of an angle sometimes from the lenticular process to the footplate, and 
it doesn't seem to have an impact, but anyway. Yeah, I mainly use the Teflon loop, and that's because I get pretty good results with it, and I'm always slightly loath to change something new. And as I was saying before, you know, if someone said to me, well, the deal is you get two decibels better closure of airbone gap, but we don't know what the 10-year results are in terms of long process erosion, that would just unsettle me a bit. So, to us, you know, there's just great experience with Teflon. There's tens of thousands have been done. Right. So I do use the uh, smart piston, smart. Uh, and uh, I just find it more elegant, and uh, it reduces one more uh, step manipulation of the, I mean, it just makes sense. I use the Teflon piston, I cream, um, in 90% of the cases. Sometimes I use the um, uh, titanium piston with a large loop, particularly when, when the, um, the incus is seen. And I use only the smart piston for maleostapedotomy because the crimping is difficult for maleostapedotomy. Correct. Yeah. I'm using uh, titanium prosthesis, um, most clip prosthesis in maleovestibulopexy crimping prosthesis. Um, and I think an average, all of these... Ta no, 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 no. Uh, and, and out of due to the technique, I do not use uh, because I do not use a laser. I cannot. I don't use the smart uh, okay. procedures. And due to the uh, stapes surgery, I do not use uh, a technique. I do not use the bucket handle. So, um, in average, I believe all of these procedures work, as we can see out of our experience. But we have to identify when they don't work. I ha later have two slides on. Uh, on this issue, because the problems we will have is incus necrosis with some of these procedures. Yeah. I will have uh, two slides on this later. Okay. I, I use the Teflon share cup prosthesis. So it's, it's a large cup with a little loop, so it's a little bit of a combination of a bucket prosthesis and the, and the cost piston. Uh, and it's Teflon, so it's easy Does to Does it trim. require crimping or no? No. 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 Okay. I just want to say that I also don't use laser in my primary surgery, but there is this heat activated uh, thing that with a battery which, which works very well to get the smart piston. Okay. So here's a clinical case. It's a 20-year-old woman uh, with progressive hearing loss, possible family history of otosclerosis, no prior history of ear disease. Fairly typical audiogram for otosclerosis, um, Carhartt's notch. Um, so here's the question of the day, I guess. Uh, we've talked about it a bit, um, and I think... Uh, Dennis could show us some of his work on this. Um, uh, what I have always, um, th this patient, uh, by the way, didn't have otosclerosis, and this is, the, this is why I wanted to open the discussion of, of uh, CT imaging. Um, so, let me just see. This patient actually had an incotostipedial, or, or an incus, incotostipedial separation right here. So, before we, well, let's, let's hear, I think most people have voiced their opinion already, but uh, who on the panel gets a CT scan on every single case? Can I say something? Of course. <laughs> Can you say something? <laughs> I do it, but I don't like to do it. <laughs> I have to do it because it's becoming a medical legal issue now, but I don't believe, we disagree, I, I know, in, in the panel, but this is the point of this course. I don't think it's interesting to, to, to ask a CT scan for any case, but I have to do it. So, yes and no. Okay. It looks like uh, two-thirds of the panel always do CT, it sounds like. Um, let's see. So why don't we, um, you want to come up and show a couple of your slides? May, may I ask a question just... Neil, may I just ask a question? Yeah. How, how many uh, in the panel that depend on the stapedia reflex as part of their diagnostic modality? Yes. I mean, do, do you feel that this is enough if you have a low frequency airborne gap, no other signs or symptoms, and an absent reflex? 
Well, this is the, the question. What does it change in our surgery? You know, we have conductive hearing loss. What we do is we do a tympanoscopy and then decide what to do. And the only issue is uh, can I help the distance what you would need a CT scan for uh, or around the window. But then you will have uh, other clinical signs for it. But why do we? Why do you have to do it? Um, we uh, this this sometimes we follow so-called medical legal issues, but uh, I wouldn't uh, blame if if I wouldn't blame you if you didn't do it. So some of your colleagues do it. I would I would love because the risk the risk of a CT scan for a cataract is countable. You know that's the only dose dependent radiation issue. Yeah. No, it's high. It's very high. No, I do agree. You ask your radiologist. Uh, ask your radiologist if he had had cataract surgery. Most of those say yes. It's an interesting discussion. I mean, the first point that the people who are asking a CT scan as you do, uh, Chris, um, is for several reasons. And the first one is to rule out any um, uh, risk of decent of suppression. But this is very rare. And I think if you have to revise, then you have to ask. But then you have to ask for a CT not to revise it for so nothing. But for primary, it's, it is so rare that I think it's not, for me, a clear condition for that. And the second point, you want to make a diagnosis preoperatively, which I understand why. But the diagnosis is made peroperatively. Even if you don't see anything on the CT scan, you have to check everything, just like you, you didn't see anything. So it, that's, it doesn't change the, 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 your decision, I think. And there are many CT in which you don't see anything and you still have a, a fixation. So th these are all the reasons why I don't like the concept of having a mandatory, mandatory CT scan pre-op. That's the only point, but I understand in some cases it is interesting, but not there, always. There was a discussion recently in the US about um, you think that the superior semicircular canal dehiscence is rare, but there are incidences of that with otosclerosis. Yes. So you can have every sign of otosclerosis and think there's otosclerosis and not feel the need for a CT and end up with a, you know, a third window phenomenon and a bad result. So that, on that case, a CT, of course, would have, would have helped. But again, it's pretty rare. Does it justify the economic burden? I, I, think, I think one issue is that CT scan early on in our career was a novelty. Now every second patient gets a CT from sinuses and stuff. And I really think that when you're discussing things with the patients, of course you run through the, the discussion that like, you know, this is most likely is autosclerosis. I'm, if you just tell them I'm going to go in and find out, the patient is going to come back to you and say, well, is there any other way that... I think you need to narrow the, the possibilities. And I think, again, given, the, given how commonly used the That's CT a scan, it's a very reasonable uh, approach. That's a good point. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Neil, for giving me the opportunity to, to give you a few words about uh, uh, imaging in uh, autosclerosis. I focus my talk um, well on is CT scan interesting in primary autosclerosis, not for revision cases, and I think it's mandatory for revision cases. You have to consider that conductive of mixed hearing loss, it not only due to middle ear involvement, but also sometimes to inner ear involvement. And in this case, surgery is contraindicated, of course. So the, the causes of conductive of mixed hearing loss are multiple, and I won't say uh, all the causes you know. These causes. What are the goals of imaging? Is to determine the cause of the conductive of mixed hearing loss and to rule out surgical contraindications. Of course, imagine give you an overview of the middle ear anatomy and, and can predict, and it's important for young surgeons, the surgical difficulties. And you can have with imaging uh, some information on hearing prognosis for the future. We know that CT scan or conventional CT, HRCT, or Conbeam CT that can uh, decrease uh, the radiation exposure uh, give you an accuracy of 95%. And you may know that 
there is some real autosclerosis with negative CT, and in this case, uh, the risk of uh, foot plate complication is higher. The sign of, um, of autosclerosis is the hypodense autosclerotic foci at the entire part of the foot plate, like you can see here on an HLCT or on a CBCT. Okay. You have also the location, and it's important to check the retrofenestral autosclerosis that can be a contraindication for surgery. Of course, you can see other diagnoses or, and it's more complicated, associate diagnosis. A middle ear congenital malformation, yeah, like you can see on this, this uh, one foot stapes, three foot three feet stapes, uh, round window atresia, and it can mimic an autosclerosis, or the, uh, this rare stapes bar, okay, which is not an autosclerosis. You can have also uh, acquired uh, ossicular anomalies, like this uh, uh, um, incudomalia dislocation, or on the CBCT, the fracture of the malleus, or the fracture of the step S, it's also a CBCT, a convene. You can have an ankylosis of the head of the malleus, tympanosclerosis in the attic, or a rare, a rare case of middle ear osteoma uh, that present like uh, an autosclerosis. To my point of view, the most important is to rule out a nine ear malformation that can be the cause of the mixed steering loss or that can be associated with, um, with autosclerosis. And there is some malformation that you can see, it's a, a Mondini uh, system, or a widening of uh, the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And sometimes, like you can see on this slide, autosclerosis, a real autosclerosis, so you will have a fixed stapes uh, the foci that you can see during surgery, but you are not able to uh, see this malformation. Of course, it's rare, but in this case, you will operate the patient and you will have a sensory neural loss. Of course, the other interest of the CT scan is to check for a semicircular canal descent. For the uh, interest of the, of the CT scan to give an overview of the middle ear, you can see an hour of all window needs, the position of the fascial nerve, the presence of an obliterative autosclerosis. Of course, uh, in the end uh, of uh, Robert Vincent, if you find uh, an obliterative autosclerosis, you will take your drill, you will make a drill out, but when you begin the surgery, and you found an obliterative autosclerosis, you close and you go back home uh, with a lot of tears. This is cases or probably the surgery will be difficult. You can see an overhanging facial canal or an overhanging facial nerve. And this uh, type of surgery uh, should be operated on by experts and not by beginners. You can see here an obliterative autosclerosis. It's not the best case to begin this surgery, of course. And on this conbeam CT, you can see the stapedial artery. Okay? For the ring prosnosis, we know that pericochlear involvement or retrofenestral autosclerosis won't have the same result than in a standard presentation. So in conclusion, the indications for imaging are for me systematic in children, routinely in children, in case of a typical presentation. If surgery is considered, I perform a CT scan routinely if surgery is considered, and of course for post-operative failure 
or uh, sensory nerve complication. Thank you for your attention. You can take it. Oh, there. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I, ju I just want to follow up on. I just want to follow up on this, and I really never think of the CT scan as a way of making a diagnosis of autosclerosis. I think of, of what? It of what? I don't think of it. Yeah, this is, I, don't know. I don't think of the CT scan as a way of making a diagnosis of autosclerosis. I think of it as a way of ruling out yes. other stuff, other especially the congenital stuff in the in the uh, in the ossicles or in the in the inner ear. I also think that once you have a conductive hearing loss, you really start seeing hypodense lesions everywhere. And I really think that, I don't know if people have looked at it or not, but I just don't trust the, what we think of as autosclerosis finding on the CT scan. I think when we approach it with the, with the conductive hearing loss in mind, we are very inclined to see things in the, on the CT scan. But my, my main reason for doing it is to make sure that we don't have any other pathology. Yeah, interesting thing was, look, you do a CT scan, you can see autosclerosis, then you go for surgery. You do a CT scan, you don't see autosclerosis, you go for surgery. Unless you see something. No, I, I'm, except, uh, yeah, I know you disagree, but it, I mean, and you, you, see another, you, you see another malformation, you go for surgery, you see another problem, you go for surgery, no. except if you have decent. Yeah, but the thing is that they don't, they go to you, Robert. Sorry? Sorry? I, I agree the with consent. you completely no, that the point. I, I disagree with this. The consent should be the same. Yeah, but you've done me. four and a half thousand, same. Robert. There no, are people but, in this but, room but who've done five. It. Sorry? There are, you've done four and a half thousand. There are people in this room who've done five. If yes, you've done five and you no, see an overhanging facial nerve, you shouldn't that, be doing surgery. I mean, we have to say what we think. Yeah, but what you think isn't necessarily applicable for everybody in anyway, the room. This is mandatory now, so the discussion closed. In France. You have to do it for sure. But now in the background, we can say what we feel. But you have to do I, it. I, that is the answer. I, so I we don't, discuss I don't know if you <laughs> have to do it, but it sounds like that's becoming the consensus. I mean, that's, yeah. it's no longer really a discussion. It's an interesting discussion, but uh, in the end, it sounds like most people feel... And, and I agree with you that in the, in, the, in the past, it was a matter of getting a CT scan when you, can, when you were suspecting it wasn't otosclerosis, when you thought there was something else going on. But now it sounds like there's really, for legal reasons and also to anticipate... Uh, surgical things that you may not want to deal with. Then and getting and the scans are getting better yeah. and the radiation dose is getting lower. The radiation so is lower, but cataracts are a real issue. I, I agree with that also. Cataracts. It's not only the cataract. If you look at the probability of risks, all these things are very, all our, all, everything you've shown is very rare. And we, for all of this, we have clinical signs, additional clinic signs. And then I totally agree, we should need, if you have clinical signs for indicating something else than a, a regular otosclerosis, then a, a CT scan is excellently and helpful. But in the standard, the 90% of the patients would have a regular otosclerosis. You do an irradiation, which is not necessary. And in so the cataract is in adults, and older people, and in children it's even worse. There's uh, two studies from uh, Australia and Britain that if you do uh, a CT, one CT scan in an underage uh, ch child has an increased risk of developing carcinoma. And uh, there's two excellent surveys, uh, Cochrane uh, cited, so it's, it's not a, not a too uh, small uh, issue. Yes. A uh, uh, few remarks. First of all, uh, and then we'll in move autosclerosis, on. You get the last word, okay? Yep, yep. Uh, in autosclerosis, my issue is not to have good results, is how to avoid complications of failure. And I think it's the issue of all the panel. Second, I don't say the same to the patient if I see an autosclerosis on the CT or if the CT is negative. If the CT is negative, I said I will do uh, an exploratory tympanotomy, and if the CT is positive, I say I will operate you from the osteoclosis. And remember that the cone beam CT decreased the exposure risk from, yes, from 5 to 10 times. 5 to 10 times less.
Thank you for abiding by that. Okay, we, we've seen this already. Round window otosclerosis will certainly show up on a CT. Okay. So that ties in a bit with this case. This is an 11-year-old, uh, no prior history of ear disease, uh, most likely uh, congenital onset of hearing loss, uh, no family history of otosclerosis, um, not particularly happy with amplification, although she's a good student. So, she has a big conductive hearing loss in, in one side. And so, can I assume, who, who would get a CAT scan on this panel? Okay, pretty much everyone, maybe not Robert. No, 11-year-old uh, with conductive hearing loss. Now, this is, this is not, would, would you do a CAT scan for this case? I know you said there's risk. I'm going to show you. Hold on. Conductive with, an, with a Carhartt. Okay. No CT. Yep. Before you decide to order a CT scan, you've got to decide whether or not you're going to intervene yes. and consider doing an operation. Because if you're not yes. going to do surgery, yes. CT is not going to change anything. Yes. Good point. Yes, of course. Well, but it, it's also a circular argument because sometimes, depending on what you find on CT, and you know, you can give them a different okay. probability of success, and they may decide to go or not for the surgery. I think Neil said they she tried a hearing aid and she wasn't happy with an FM system. So yeah, she's 11. She's getting to the age where she's not. She doesn't want to be the the kid in the class with the hearing aid. So, okay, she had a CAT scan, which was absolutely normal. So, uh, no otos otospongiosis, uh, everything seems to be in place, the ossicles are present. Um, I don't know if I was supposed to show you that yet already or not, but I guess I did. Okay, she had basically, she had a, a minor malformation of the ossicles. She had, uh, you can see the, I don't know which screen is easier, but the, this, the incus is rather bowed. She has a somewhat thinned out um, incus uh, stapes arch, but it was intact, it was, uh, it was, immobile at the level of the stapes. There was no stapedius tendon at all. So this was a, a minor malformation, and this was just about a month ago, so, uh, um, so I don't know yet how she did, but she seems to be hearing better. Okay. Do, you not, do you not have a question over the consent issue in the US of 11-year-olds? I'd think long and hard about an 11-year-old, because let's imagine it's your 11-year-old, who I assume is quite bright, mm -hmm. And possibly able to I make... I have an 11-year-old. How did you yeah, know that? Possibly... <laughs> I've known you for many years. Uh -huh. Possibly able to make a decision. But you could quite easily have the parents make a decision for an 11-year-old. You could get a failure, and that 11-year-old will turn around at 16, which is the percentage in the UK, and say, why did you let this jerk operate on me and get a failure? Why didn't you leave it till I was 16 so I could make my own decision about my future? So you think 16-year-olds make better not decisions Not necessarily. Than well, they don't, obviously don't if we look at what's happened yeah. uh, in, in Brexit recently. But, you know, at the end of the day, that is the age of consent, mm -hmm. and there's no hurry to do this. Mm -hmm. and, and they do have a right. And, and so that, it's a whole new question that comes mm -hmm. in. Yeah, but it depends, again, this is an interesting point, again, a congenital morphine. I will talk about that tomorrow. But, I mean, it's really making a decision on a young child is a case-by-case -case decision. It's, you cannot make an average discussion. It needs to be discussed case-by-case -case because you can have the same 11-year-old uh, uh, child with the same 40 dBi bone gap who is not happy with the hearing aid, having trouble at school, and then you have to do something. Uh, so it's really depending on each situation. I just find also that the Baha software provide a very, very good... No, but we, I mean, it's cosmetically, they could play around with it to make it look almost like not a, not a hearing aid device. It's, it's a very, you know, if you have a very creative parent, they could do a lot of stuff with the Baha software, and I think uh, it works very, very well. And this has been my... I just don't like operating on for this kind of cases at 11 years old. I want to see him 14, 15 before I, uh, I do something. Well, I'm not, I wasn't implying that I wouldn't operate. I was implying that you have to think very, very carefully and depending on the child. And I get nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds who come to me with other problems and say to their parents, 
yeah, I want my tonsils out. I don't care what you think. They're hurting me. And, you know, it may well be a very intelligent child who's mentally not a 10 or 11 year old, much more mature than that. But you've got to consider. What time do you want? You've got to consider. 10, 10, 15. Okay, so maybe one more case. Okay, any other discussions? So this is um, a middle-aged male, 43-year-old male, with progressive hearing loss for many years. He has uh, no prior history of ear disease, no family history of hearing loss. He has a bilateral mixed hearing loss with much worse hearing in his right ear than his left. Uh, his word recognition is excellent. Um, his health wasn't great, and um, uh, we initially... Well, he was, he was initially treated with amplification. And, of course, on CT, he had florid otos, otospongiosis, retrophrenestrol. And what happened next was that he started to have a hearing fluctuation with uh, vertigo and tinnitus uh, and some very unusual attacks, which I think were drop attacks. It's a little hard for him to really describe what happens, but he essentially passes out. He describes tinnitus, he describes vertigo, and he describes basically passing out. And this happened numerous times. Uh, he presented uh, with worsened hearing in the right ear. Um, as you can see, his bone line has worsened, his word recognition has worsened. Um, he was treated medically with oral and intratympanic steroids. Uh, he was treated with diuretics. And ultimately, he did improve over time until he came back this year with this hearing test. So uh, he still has quite a bit of hearing loss. He's very unsatisfied with amplification. And so obviously he has Meniere's disease, he has otosclerosis. And the question for the panel is, is Meniere's disease a contraindication, an absolute contraindication for stapy surgery? Let's start with Mark. Well, I think I don't know about absolute contraindication, but it's definitely something that would make me pause and think about it for a long time. And I think one of the factors is how long it is an active Meniere's disease or it's been quiet for, you know, if it's been quiet for two or three years, supposedly uh, burnt out, then I may have the discussion about surgery. But in this case, like two years ago, he was fluctuating with drop attacks. I would try to push off the surgery in terms of stapedectomy as, as far as possible. Yes, I would, would also be very reluctant doing a stapes on her or him. Um, he will probably end up with a cochlear implant sooner or later. So, so uh, just to press it a little bit, because he's, he keeps coming back and keeps asking, you know, can we do the surgery now? Can we do the surgery? You know, he's, he's miserable, really. He, yep. He's not hearing well. Um, you said you'd be reluctant. Does that mean you would absolutely not do it? Or? No, no, not absolutely. But I would, uh, if he insists, and if uh, I understand that all my concerns, he has also understood, and goes for the risks, then yes. I would do the surgery. Yes. But it mu I must be sure that he understood what are the problems involved, the risks involved, and if he ends up... And would you insist, as Mark said, that there's been a quiescent period of time when he's not actively having vertigo? Would you wait for the six months or a year or two years or if possible? Or would you ever consider doing it uh, when there's vertigo present? Well, probably I would have gone earlier. If, if I confirm Meniere's disease, I would probably go for a sarcotomy first. Sarcotomy. And, uh, a, sac a, sac sac a sac surgery? Yeah. Okay. A sacotomy, yeah, sac surgery. Interesting. Okay. Anybody else on the panel want to? I want to operate this patient, even if he's... Yeah. Never. Never. No. I had bad experience with uh, autosclerosis combined to Meniere's disease. How would you re rehabilitate? Would, what would you offer no. him? Or just the, I had some patient, two or three patients, who developed the Meniere's disease after the surgery. And they dropped down, mm -hmm. particularly in a professional of music. Right. And no, I won't operate this patient. I will, say, I will say, uh, first of all, uh, the, the hearing results won't be good. And the risk of having disabling vertigo is very important, I think, in this patient. I <coughs> I f definitely won't do a stabies. I, I mean, no matter how much you bring up the, uh, the, the, air, the air levels, you're not going to do them any good. 
But I really think, you know, given the age of this guy, this guy is somebody that who needs to go on with his life. So I really would push him towards cochlear implants. Towards I think cochlear, cochlear implantation. Implants. I would just strongly recommend it, encourage him with every word that I could say to him, because this guy is going to lose his hearing further. You know he's going to end up with cochlear implants. And the only thing that you're doing by delaying things is that you minutes. are, you know, incapacitating him for another five or, or ten years. So Sadji's got a, a very interesting histopathology slide of someone with Meniere's disease and otosclerosis with a hugely dilated saccule right yeah. underneath the foot yeah. plate, which looks very scary, I would say. Um, I think a labyrinthectomy and a cochlear implant would do this guy world of good, really. Get rid of his... Labyrinthectomy? Well, you, do, yeah, you drill him out and then do a cochlear implant. So, oh, cochlear implant. So, yeah. so I think you'd get rid of his dizziness and you'd give him a hearing. Interesting. I've yet to have the thrill of a patient with this history, but I probably wouldn't operate. Would not? I wouldn't... I wouldn't say no, uh, just like Rob, it would be case by case discussion. It happened to me that I had to do because it was miserable and things like this. And it's not the same result. It's, it's true we've, we've done it. But on the other side, if you are absolutely sure that you have a decrease of the bone conduction and air conduction, it will finish with a cochlear implant. Why not taking the chance to do the surgery and improve even temporarily the, the case until the level of the, of the cochlear implant appears? He's certainly not. He's not a candidate, really. Yeah, but, oh, no, of course, you have to wait, of course, you have to wait. But it happens that you can also improve the vertical post-op of patients having vertical previously. No, it's true. So uh, it's, 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 not, it's not a... a Cody we don't have procedure? The not the truth, but it, we don't have the clear answer to that. It's very difficult. S Soundbridge? Maybe. Offer, talk about Soundbridge also, just to, uh, to have a his complete... His bone line is not... It's borderline, right? Thibaut, Thibaut? where's Thibaut? See here? He's right there. Oh. And so it's not uh, a very good indication for a sound bridge because the, the low frequency are quite low. Uh, perhaps a MET cochlear would be better in that case. But uh, sure, if you put a MET, uh, you will close the bone gap plus give amplification. The hearing result could be good, but uh, what about uh, uh, worsening the vertigo uh, by that surgery? Uh, I think it's even worse because yes. then the, the disease, as we said, is going to keep going on and it's costly for the patient. Mm -hmm. Sure. So then it's even more. I just feel very strongly about a patient like this guy because patients need something to go on with their life. You need, something, you need to give him a workhorse so he could go on with his life. And I think the idea that, okay, we're going to do a stabage, we're going to bring up the, uh, the healing by you know, 15 or 20 dp, he's still going to suffer. You're not going to help him. And I really think that we have, you know, for us, yeah, the patient could come in this year and next year, but this patient, he's 43, he's in the midst of his career, you know, he probably has a family to raise, so you need to give him something that will work for him and something that he doesn't have to worry about, you know, um, you know having surgery every second year. And I really think that everybody, uh, probably uh, Robert has a lot of more experience with cochlear implants, but I really think, again, the only two procedures that work in otology are stabies and cochlear implants. Cochlear implants is... Uh, so you, and you and I, I have no problem telling this guy that he's got to go back to work, he's going to function, he's going to speak on the phone. But he's not quite a candidate, at least not in the U.S., for a cochlear implant. I think uh, the presence of yet. a conductive component should not preclude the fact that you have a... Because you're not going to, hold, you're not going to help him. He's going to... Well, I don't, I, even with a hearing aid, I cannot see him. I cannot see him functioning. Well, if you're lucky, he'll have a, a dead ear, and then you can do the you cochlear implant. <laughs> 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 and the other issue, which is really pertinent, I think, Oswaldo can talk to us. Maybe um, this is a this is a condition of the of the Oda capsule. This is not, you know. So so how can we address his the medical management of the otosclerosis. He has florid, you know, cochlear otosclerosis. So 
Does, does everyone or does anybody use the bisphosphonates at this point? I have not really integrated it into my practice, but it's, it sounds to me that this is really the future for otosclerosis. Say that again. Well, I, I, was, I was listening. You keep on discussing two inner ear diseases. Many are associated with a, a cochlear otosclerosis. And you do nothing for inner ear doing surgery. So why don't keep trying clinical treatment before? Of, of course, it can eventually end up with a cochlear implant. That's all right. But first, you have to tr try to stabilize, stabilize the activity of otospongiosis, minimize the inner ear damage, and in parallel, treat many eye disease. We have some improvement of uh, hearing in this case, in similar this case, mm -hmm. so I think it's worth. We, it's uh, another option that we have. It's a safe one, and uh, it can treat. It would be fascinating to the see problem if it that improves are the Meniere's the disease. disease. Yeah, well, that's it. Could, it. it could improve the Meniere's disease if the Meniere's is secondary. Meniere also to because can be secondary to mm -hmm. a high concentration of enzymes and right. other right. products of the Very osseous absorption. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, fully agree, but uh, it, uh, it, uh, it uh, leads us to the last question. How do you diagnose the cochlear autosclerosis with a CT scan? So it means that you perform a CT scan. In each patient that you, you, oh, you, you are thinking, it could be an autosclerosis. It means everybody. Well, this is also asymmetric hearing loss, so imaging of some type should, should, will be done anyway. No, yeah. but you can also think that you have cochlear otosclerosis if you have a bone conduction dropping down, yes. not only on the CT scan. If you have a mixed hearing loss with a 50 dB bone okay. conduction, then you... If you have a, poor, um, a pure uh, sensory neural hearing loss, how could you diagnose the otosclerosis? No, but then it's, a, I think... <laughs> Then it's a different discussion. Yes. Pure sensory neural, then of course you do to, do you go to imaging. It's a autosclerosis we are talking pure, about. Pure, yeah. Well, if you did an MRI, you, uh, apparently now you can see uh, the otosclerotic foci as well. So, um, interesting. Okay. I do think we're going to hear a lot more about the bisphosphonates and uh, it will be integrated into our treatment. I believe that's coming very soon. Stay tuned. Oswaldo's going to tell us so I think um, we could try and keep this short, but um, we do one more. Is, is everyone melting or? We have time. So if you're Can you just turn those, the f you know, if you set off the fire alarm, the sprinklers will, will just come down. That would be fine, wouldn't it? Okay, we, I'm going to do one more if that's okay. Um, so this is a 64-year-old woman who had surgery in both ears uh, many years ago. Uh, and for the past several years has uh, suffered increasing hearing loss in her right ear. She has no vestibular system, symptoms, she had no trauma, uh, and she's, she's a nurse, she's uh, unhappy with amplification, and she wants something done. So I'm going to actually go right into the operating room, and then we're going to ask you what might be appropriate. So what you're seeing is a somewhat eroded incus and a rather deeply penetrant... Did you do a pre -op CT? <laughs> Actually did not, believe me. Or, well, she didn't want one. I mean, that was offered to her. She did not want one. She's a nurse. She said, no thanks. So um, who should we start with? It's not an easy situation. Robert? It's very difficult specifically because you didn't ask for a CT scan before in this yeah. case. Well, <laughs> would, would it have I changed ask. your... For revision, I ask. Would it have changed your... No, it wouldn't have changed, but then you, can yeah. you have to explain yeah. in more yeah. details to the yeah. patient that if we keep going on and remove the prosthesis, clearly there is a higher risk of sensory no hearing loss. You can insist a little bit more. But then, and then if the patient is happy for the surgery, then you have to do it. And in that case... Uh, of course, you need the laser to treat this kind of situation because you can 
progressively uh, decrease the thickness of this uh, fibrous tissue filling all the, uh, over the window until you can reach the distal tip of the prosthesis and then you can try to remove it. But if you, when you try to remove it, if you have a resistance, and specifically, I'm talking about my own experience and what I would do, if you try to remove it and if you have a resistance and if it's specifically it's a wire prosthesis and it seems to be a wire prosthesis, then in that case, it's better to leave it and to, to do a fenestra in another, in another location, okay? But if you can remove it, then you can do it. But then you, you need to decrease the thickness of the tissue first. Well, I haven't come across one like this. This might be the one where with them awake, it might help. Um, I think if this is wire with Teflon, it wouldn't worry me as much as if it was all wire uh, or all metal. Um, I'm really not sure what I'd do in this situation. I would leave, leave the existing piston and do another, another finasterum. Because I think, you know, you've no idea what's happening at the bottom of that. I would do another one, another hull, but leave the piston and work around it. Whether I'd get between the facial nerve or not. And then obviously, your incus doesn't look too great. It, it, it's not but too I bad. think you'd it probably is. get a, a normal piston. So I'd probably, if I could, go between the facial nerve and, the, and that piston. You know, try and find a w way around it. Yeah. But I would be very reluctant to take that out. I mean, as Robert says, if you, if you really thin down and it's not quite as deep in as it looks, yeah. but that looks to me like it's right into the neck. Yeah. So that's a long way in, I would say. But obviously, I would have looked to check my CT. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. So uh, I would palpate that prosthesis. Palpate it. Palpate and, it? Yeah, and if it is moving, I would actually, I, I think one of the things that we are underutilizing is the bone cement. I would bridge the gap between the prosthesis and the incus with bone cement. And I think you could do it very, very easily in a situation like this. And uh, I, have, I, I have to say that 10 years ago, I had never used any bone cement. And uh, over the last two years, almost um, 30 or 40% of my osteoplasties are... So you would, leave, you would leave the old? I would leave everything, make sure yeah. it's moving, and then bridge the gap with bone cement. I asked the nurse for the cement. I don't actually know the <laughs> it's a It comes in a little bottle and it's a very Does it come in a bag this, this big from the farm hardware that's, store? That's it. No? <laughs> uh, I will do nothing so till the amplification is available. I would give it a soft try to get uh, the procedures out, removing the connective tissue, try to get it out if uh, this is, would, would be possible only with extensive force. I would leave it and do a promontory window and a malleo vestibular pexy. I, I agree with Chris. I would just leave it, don't touch it, make another finestra. I, I don't think the amount, personally, Robert may disagree, but I don't think we, we as humans can detect, detect the force that it requires to rupture you know, the inner ear membrane. So I don't think it's if low force or too much force, I don't think we have that you know, difference. Any other uh, questions or comments? I, I think it's a very good indication to let the prosthesis in and, and put the middle ear implant on the wrong window. Then you close the one gap and provide amplification without the risk of rem removing the prosthesis. Interesting. Let's say you have a patient who doesn't have any money, can't pay the middle ear implant, which is basically uh, the majority of the patient. Yes, yes. We're so talking medically, the in the perfect world. Oh, yeah. Which, of you course. You mean in France? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this woman, what was the speech description? This was pretty poor, wasn't speech it? Speech was, was somewhat down, but yeah. I don't think I would necessarily have suspected based on that. Yes, it, it is down, but someone with this much auditory deprivation could easily have some word recognition decline. Yeah, but you make, you're taking big risk yeah. for possibly modest gain. Yes. Yes. Well, we had a very long discussion. She understood what she was up against really and what, for, what the options for were. For earrings, the, the real solution is it's an implant. Yeah, it's, it's so what happened? Well, I did, uh, I left the prosthesis in. The old one stayed in. You can see it's actually, a, it is a Teflon piston. It's a wire piston. And, uh, and I made a separate fenestra and uh, used a bucket handle. Uh, I am not sure that she has a good result. It's just recent, so I don't know her result. Uh, she did have about 24 hours of vertigo after the surgery, uh, so we'll, we'll see. 
Next year, I'll let you know. Yeah. I think that's going to be it, huh? One of the things, Neil, we were talking about earlier, Robert and I were talking, but it, coming next year, you know, people may not be here next year, but it might be quite nice to have a newsletter in eight weeks, ten weeks, about one or two of these cases, just to say such and such a case that we discussed, or the interesting case on, on Thursday, um, these were the results. Yep. Can I ask you a question, just to know, yeah, uh, just please, I, I will finish myself, but can you... Is there, an, is there an occupation that would be really be a contraindication for surgery? Prime Minister. <laughs> of what country, yeah. <laughs> oh, but, but is there? Huh? Ballet dancer? Okay. Yeah. Working or? Yeah. Oh, divers is a problem, but it's not a contraindication. <laughs> but it's very, very, very difficult. I had patient uh, to, uh, to operate, I remember one, was a professional diver. So he had to continue, but on the other side, he wanted to be operated. So I asked him not to do it for one year, and he, he, he did that. He stopped doing this for one year, and then he came back and he was fine. So even that for me is not a contraindication. But this is special because it's related to the profession. If we speak about the general population, what I ask just to be safe for the patient, after stapedotomy, I ask them not to dive anymore if they can avoid that. Because it, I don't think it's a higher risk. Probably I believe in the vein graft in this kind of, okay, situation. But if they have a problem in, in a very deep uh, location with a vertigo, it can be a real uh, disaster for him. So if they can stop, it's better. Flying, flying for me, it's, uh, flying is one month, three weeks at least. I don't know if Denise is do the same, but it's uh, three weeks, one month, or six, <laughs> six weeks? Three months. Yeah. Uh, this is different. Yes, that's right. Yeah. No, no when I mean, but you have a, a kind of law for, for the professional. And uh, for patient, it's different. But I, uh, and a TGV train also is a problem. So I ask them one month, the same thing. So just before you leave, it's important for us to know that. I know it would be better to do it uh, anonymously, but I, I'd love to know, uh, you came here with some experience with uh, your practice and so on. I just want to know if, I don't ask if you learned something, but did you get something which might change a little bit your practice or improve your practice or help in some direction? I think we have to improve this kind of presentation. But do you think you, can, can you let me know if you, just raise up if you have some points that you picked up. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be going straight next door to ophthalmology and stealing their MDR blades. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've got one, one question and it is about leaving the vestibule open. Because we in Spain, uh, in our hospital, in another hospitals, we we don't seal the the window without pericon with pericondrum, with vein, with anything. We leave, uh, we do a stapedotomy and a stapedectomy, and put the prosthesis, the prosthesis in at the incus and without no protection. I want to know your your experience. Our experience is good. No fistula, no more vestibular symptoms, not not more uh, wrong results. Comparing like uh, with another hospitals. But what technique do you perform? I do perform a small hole. Both uh, a, a small a, hole, a, a zero point eight hole, and uh, there are six millimeter pieces, and I don't. Mm -hmm seal the oval window, but not a total stapedectomy without Without sealing. a total stapedectomy or half stapedectomy. That's, that's okay. our school, a, a lot okay. of years. Mm, and the results okay. are the same. I, I, I know everybody. No, if I perform half a stapedectomy 
or a total stapedectomy. You seal, I always yeah, seal. Yeah. And that's the general opinion. Yes. Okay, so one of the things that I've struggled with was one of the first things you talked about, which is patient positioning. Because I, putting somebody head down seems counterintuitive when you want to reduce blood flow in the middle ear, you want to reduce uh, any valsalva effect, and I think for you to achieve what you achieve, you, uh, you rely on having one anaesthetist who's going to do the same every time with you. And that doing this uh, in a situation where you don't have the same access to reliable anaesthetic technique, I'm not sure that you could carry out that, the procedure in that way. Well, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate. You know, one of the advantages of being in a small district general hospital with a relatively small pool of anaesthetists is they were all keen to work with me for obvious reasons in the alternative sector. But I, I chose one who was particularly good, and there were three others who he trained. Um, we don't have a problem. I mean, it, it is very counterintuitive that if you put somebody upside down, they're going to be all right. But we don't have a problem do with bleeding. I put them in that position because that gives me a vertical ear canal. And Why don't you you know, well, I, this is how I started. You, you know, you start something and you start getting good results and you're reluctant to change. The whole thing about this meeting is not to tell you how to do things. It's to give you ideas about what might help. And uh, you know, as a very simplistic man, it makes sense to me that if I'm trying to put a prosthesis in, be it a torp, because I use torps, not porps, or or be it a, a stapes prosthesis, if I put it in vertical, it's much less likely to fall over if the patient's in that position. There's nothing more frustrating than putting the bucket handle in, picking up the two needles to position it, and finding it's gone over by 30 degrees. Whereas if you've got the patient in that position, you know, everything is vertical, and that works for me. But I, I'm, not, you know, I'm not saying you should do it that way. What you should do is is look at 20 people and pick up maybe one tip off each of them and hopefully one decade on you'll be a better otologist. So that's what works. And I've never changed the technique. I mean, I went to watch Robert 1993 and I thought, he seems pretty good. You know, I think I'll copy him because he's done lots and lots, which is what I said in my presentation. And that's why I've never changed from doing a vein graft. The vein graft's great because you can't drop the prosthesis into the vestibule. It's fi difficult to find the hole. You have to remember where the hole is in your brain, but you can't put the prosthesis into the vestibule. So that, that strikes me as being protective. And it, it makes sense to me as somebody who is interested in engineering that having some kind of seal is a good idea, but I can't prove it. None of us can prove that a vein graft statistically is any better. But it's very interesting that the Civil Aviation Authority and all the air crews want a vein graft. Can I just make a comment? Of First, I mean, when you have that position, you're definitely going to have, I, I would think, more bleeding. Uh, no, you don't think so? No. Anyway, I, I, the other thing that concerns me about that position is that, you know, it, to me, I want the chest of the patient to be below the ear so I have more space to move. Here, I mean, you're, you're inconveniencing. You do I do transcanal, yeah, and I do it. The other thing about the issue of sealing the, uh, the stepidotomy, I just think that if you have a you know, whenever you're introducing another step, the, uh, the ceiling, and you don't really have indication that this makes a difference or not, you, you, inc you increase the chance of having issues. So I really think I do my stepidotomy with a 0.7 millimeter, and I do the 0.6 6, uh, millimeter. And I, but of course, if you take out half the stabies or you take out, your, you take out the whole foot plate, you need to seal it with something. But uh, for regular stepidotomy, routine stuff, I just don't see anything. I just put the prosthesis and um, no problem. I think the ceiling, unless you have an oozer or a gusher, um, the cochlea is a capillary. So uh, if you don't do another hole in the cochlea, the fluid cannot come out. Um, it probably is, uh, the ceiling is rather a protection for infection, maybe. Yeah. So if you get middle ear fusion or whatever after surgery, and uh, the bleeding point, I think we should talk, what are you using for local anesthesia? You infiltrate, obviously. And so, of course, if you put the head down, everybody expected to have more bleeding, sure. So what, what is it you are using? Uh, to, 
two things. I use uh, xylocaine and adrenaline. I don't remember the concentration. Well, one point about your remark regarding the, the strong connection that you need to have you with your anesthesis. It's, it's very important. And I, it reminds me of a very nice story in Germany. I went been doing surgery in Germany, and I was facing a very difficult case, transcanal. It was, took me a while to do this. And, and the anesthetist came to see me, and he said, I was operating and commenting what I was doing. And he said, uh, can you tell me how long you're going to take? And I was uh, polite, so I said, uh, it's going to take, uh, so I wanted to be just average. I say, uh, I say, one hour? One hour? Okay. Then he, came, he left. And then one hour later, <laughs> he woke up the patient. And so he's waking up. He came to see me. He said, Guy, here you're in Germany, not in France. One hour is one hour. <laughs> I have another question. Uh, what do you think about the, the tendon preservation, or the steps tendon preservation? Do you think it's uh, useful or not? Useful, really useful. Because uh, useless, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> not useful. <laughs> Not useful, useless. Yes. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think it make any difference because anyway, you know, the, the stapes is fixed with this patient, so the, the stapes then doesn't work anymore. So I don't think it's going to change anything. So maybe, I know you're a musician, so maybe you feel something different. But uh, really, uh, we tried in a different way in the past because we didn't preserve the tendon, we cut and we tried to rebuild it. With, and I know that the other option would be to preserve it and to. Um, cut the stapes underneath, but this makes the surgery more difficult, and I don't think it's going to change anything. Yeah, I think if you think how the stapedius tendon works, it works in a different way if you've got a prosthesis in, because it'll pull the prosthesis probably against the edge of the uh, stapedotomy. It's not tilting the stapes anymore, because the stapes are not going to move, so you're just hoping that it'll pull your piston backwards. So I don't think it's going to work particularly well. And I would say, basically, in surgery, again, doing cute stuff does not work. You know, you need, if, you know, don't go out on a limp, you know, because every little step that you add to the procedure ends up causing complications and problems in time. The other comment that I want to make is that I always joke around, I say I never speak to the anesthetist. And I really think that sometimes we make a big deal about this. I think patients who bleed are going to bleed, patients who are not going to bleed, they're not going to bleed. Uh, I just don't think that a 10, uh, a, a, you know, a 10 point uh, increase in the blood pressure would make that much of a difference. Yeah, I, 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 don't think it's the, uh, I don't think it's the 10 point increase or decrease in blood pressure. I think it's the constancy of blood pressure. You saw the slide I showed over two hours this morning and over two hours there wasn't an alteration by more than 10 millimeters. It, it's, it's having constant conditions that's important, not, not absolutely low conditions, but constancy. I found, I found, especially with the anesthesiologist, the, the blood pressure isn't so much important. It's the, it's anesthesia. It's sleep and no pain. Patient can be deeply asleep, but he has severe pain. Or you can tell it's starting to bleed, and I, I say, well, in two minutes, your patient stands up. And the anesthesiologist looks like this, hey, and two minutes later, the patient makes like this, you know? Uh, so the anesthesia, the bleeding is always an indication that the anesthesia is not deep enough and this patient has pain. One more question. Another important thing, I th uh, talking on in autosclerosis, is uh, in the preparative assessment, the profession of the patient, I mean. The profession, the, the yeah. job of yeah, the patient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I explained, oh, here in France, in Spain too, there are more and more professionals of wine, good cookers, chefs, it's this kind of, of professions. And, you know, the problems are not permanent, mostly are not uh, big, but, but imagine a professional, an important professional of wine, that you miss to ask uh, the profession and then you perform the surgery and there is the disturb of the taste. And in terms of uh, informed consent, I think it's really, really, really important in this region, in Spain, Japan and other regions to, to assess about the, 
the profession, the job, the job of the of the patients, because these problems can be an important legal problem, I think. It, it's not that important in the UK, but in France, in Spain, it's yes. important. That's yes, true. that's true. <laughs> no, I mean, you have to have consent before, and yeah. you have to put that on, on the consent. Because it is a special patient, uh, a different no, no, patient. No, I think you, knew, you yeah. need to put everything, this is what we do, we put everything for each patient. Yes. All possible complications, including the taste disturbance, because it happens. Even if you... Um, but you, have, you have to you consider it. In even if you preserve more the product more. sometimes, they still complain sometimes. So it's yes. very strange. And uh, what I say is, you have to put that on a consent, and you have to explain everything, including this point. But postoperatively, it's interesting because it happens that sometimes you cut the corda and they don't complain, and sometimes you you, you don't e even touch. touch the corda and they complain. So my point is that don't ask anything post-op. If they have a problem, they will talk about it. Yes, I, I think. It I think it's really important both in the consenting process and preoperatively and for anybody perhaps starting off in their careers when I do the letter about the patient I say and I have discussed with Mrs. Smith the post-operative complications which include hearing loss, facial palsy and all the rest of it and quantified these complications from my series and I do that at the consent process. They cannot turn around at a later date then. I send them that letter the copy of the letter I've sent to the GP. They can't turn around and say, you didn't discuss this with me. Chris had an interesting case. I don't know whether, do you remember your case? Yeah, yeah. well, um, this is not stapies, but with a cyclopathy, I had somebody came in and had taste disturbance. And my perception generally is that when they've got taste disturbance and they've got a great hearing result, they're not too bothered about the taste disturbance. But she had an cyclopathy that didn't work and she got taste disturbance. And she said, oh, well, you've got taste disturbance. and. Well, I said, well, you know, we told you about your taste disturbance before the operation. She said, oh, well, no, you didn't. So we got the consent form, and it wasn't on the consent form. You know, it's always on the consent form, but it wasn't on the consent form, so it hadn't been discussed. And I thought, oh, no, you know what we're going to do here. So, and I said, oh, I see here, it says on the consent form, uh, dead ear and facial nerve palsy. So you're saying that if we mentioned about the taste, you wouldn't have had the operation, but you'd have been quite happy to have a facial nerve palsy. I said, oh, okay, fair enough. So, but, but I think, you know, if they get a good hearing result, they're less bothered about their taste. But there are definitely medical legal cases with professional people. Um, I've got a guy who runs a chain of restaurants nationally, and he had a cyclic surgery done by a head and neck surgeon who didn't consent to him about his taste disturbance, and he got taste disturbance. And, you know, they, they had to settle that. There was no way they could defend that. Um, so I think you have to mention it. And for your special patients, you have to really say to them, what would it matter to you if you got a permanent taste disturbance? Okay, I have, um, th I'm uh, Christian Mahanta from Zurich, Switzerland. I make the NRL approach and uh, I'm happy to see how, how smart you can handle a trans kennel with, the, with not a lot of lesions. Continuing with the lasers, use the, the fiber laser that is also very smart on uh, uh, getting in around the tissue. I'm used to the CO2 laser that makes wonderful holes in the staples foot plate, even if they are a little bit thicker. Is there any uh, reason that you think it's better to use the fiber than the CO2 laser? By the way, the last patient I did was a CO2 laser with handheld piece. Because really, it's a very nice tool. Uh, I, I saw the Omni guide. It's, it's, uh, because it's a very specific thing. They put a fiber uh, with a lot of mirrors inside, just to make it simple. And so it, it, it able to drive, to drive the uh, CO2 uh, beam until the end of, uh, uh, of the fiber. So what I believe, again, it's very simple. I believe if you touch something, you are more accurate than if you shoot at a distance with a micro manipulator. This is the only reason. And I was moving to OmniGuide because he was combining two safety points, the CO2, which is the safest one, plus the handheld piece. So that's the, the reason why I prefer having a, a fiber, because you touch the target. Um, we, one of the interesting things of doing the Lion uh, network and seeing lots of different surgeons operate, you see lots of different techniques. 
And that's why I don't think the end oral is as good as the per oral, because I've seen loads of people operate. But equally with the laser, when it's a proximal micromanipulator, we've seen surgeons hit the incus, hit the canal, hit the corda, you know, just things in the way. And it, it seems, well, that's crazy to do that, but it's not that, it doesn't seem to be that difficult to be, hit something on the way in. And bear in mind that you're not actually seeing your CO2, you're seeing an aiming beam that's a different laser. Um, so they've got to be aligned. You can also get at the anterior cross with the, the, the fibre. And the thing about the end oral is that the, when you're doing a stapy surgery, the, the narrowest thing that you come across is the tympanic ring. Um, it's, not, it's not the isthmus in the canal that causes the problem. It's, it's more distal to that. Um, so I, I, that's why I can't see the end oral helps. Unless the ear canal is narrowed by otitis externa, which is a contraindication to you operating anyway.